On this episode, an immortal trio, a trip through time, and the new Soviet values. It's difficult to overstate the popularity of director Leonid Gaidai in the Soviet Union. His comedies enjoyed tremendous success at the time of their release, and, judging by frequent airings of his films and television, and the number of views they attract on video sites, they still do. He is a war hero, a stage actor, and a director whose career spanned five decades. Gaidai's films are loved by the young and the old, by top politicians and ordinary workers. His movies are mandatory in any list of best Soviet pictures. But who is Gaidai, and why do his films enjoy such popularity? Leonid's father, Iov Gaidai, was exiled from the Ukrainian area of Poltava to the Russian Far East for being an anti-Tsar revolutionary. There, in a small remote town of Svobodny, Leonid Gaidai, Iov's third child, was born on January 30, 1923. The family moved to Chita and then to another Siberian city of Irkutsk, where Leonid grew up. His high school graduation left little time to celebrate, taking place just as Nazi Germany invaded the USSR in 1941. Serving in a reconnaissance unit, Gaidai performed with distinction, on one occasion destroying a German machine gun position with grenades, which earned him a medal for battle merit. In March 1943, Gaidai suffered a serious injury from a landmine, an action which put him in a hospital for a long time and spared him from combat for the rest of the war. After working at an Irkutsk theater for a few years, Gaidai came to Moscow and began attending the All Union State Institute of Cinematography, or VGIK, where he met his future wife, Nina Grebeshkova. When the two married in 1953, Grebeshkova kept her maiden name as she was already credited as such in several film roles. Graduating from VGIK in 1955, Gaidai trained as an assistant director on Boris Barnett's picture Liana, where he also played one of the main roles. A Weary Road is Gaidai's debut as a director, made jointly with another beginner, Valentin Nevzorov. A period drama taking place in late 19th century Russia, the story of an exile in Siberia probably had a personal connection to Gaidai's family history. During a blizzard, a station master at a remote northern location recalls in flashbacks the tale of his tragic love and the crime for which he was banished. The film is not outstanding in any way, but it made Gaidai a full-fledged director. An even happier occasion took place the year after the film's release. The Gaidai household welcomed its newest member, a daughter named Oksana. For his second picture, Gaidai chose a genre which would eventually define his career. A groom from the other world, a satirical comedy lampooning pointless bureaucracy marked Gaidai's first work with renowned actors Georgi Witsen and Rostislav Plyat. Due to a mix-up, a petty bureaucrat is declared legally dead, losing his employment and endangering his upcoming wedding. Determined to do everything by the book, the bureaucrat visits a hospital to obtain a certificate of living, where he is assumed to be a madman. Criticism of bureaucracy was a common element in the films of the Khrushchev Thaw, but Gaidai may have gone too far. The officials heavily censored the film, reducing a feature-length picture to a measly 47 minutes. The resulting film had a very limited release and placed Gaidai's short career in jeopardy. To play it safe, Gaidai directed Thrice Resurrected, a patriotic drama with typical socialist realism elements. Two women are rushing to oversee the opening of a new power plant and are stranded in a small town without transport. To help them, a group of schoolchildren rally the citizens to repair an obsolete steamboat, which previously participated in the events of the Russian Civil War and the Second World War. 
Gaidai himself has a cameo as a sleepy inventor who turns his back on the viewer, reflecting his attitude towards the project. The film did not attract the attention of the critics and was soon forgotten. Comedy anthology films were common in the 1960s USSR, where several short films, often by different directors, would be packaged into one feature-length showing. Still cautious of the new director, the officials entrusted Gaidai to make a short film, and Gaidai was happy to return to comedy. A huge fan of silent-era comedy actors such as Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and Harold Lloyd, Gaidai created an homage to the genre with Doc Barbos and the Unusual Cross. A very short film consisting of a continuous chase with no dialogue, it follows three hapless poachers running away from their dog, which is trying to fetch a lit stick of dynamite. The simple formula and entertaining physical comedy proved popular, and Guy Dai immediately set out to make a sequel. The plot of The Bootleggers is almost identical to Dog Barbos, except that the season was changed from summer to winter, the poachers turn into moonshiners. And instead of running away from the dog, the trio must chase it when it steals a crucial moonshining component. The main reason for the film's popularity were the stars of the show, a trio of caricatures, a satire of the underclass, known only by their nicknames. Coward, a faint-hearted, guilt-ridden man played by Georgi Witsen. Fool, a burglar and an alcoholic represented by Yuri Nikulin. And Pro, a burly mastermind of petty crimes portrayed by Yevgeny Morgunov. The memorable trio quickly became an icon of Soviet comedy. After the success of his short films, Gaidai was able to direct a feature-length comedy anthology all by himself. Strictly Business is a film comprised of two short and one long unrelated segments, all based on the writings of American author O. Henry. The first segment, The Roads We Take, about a ruthless Wild West gangster turned businessman, is markedly different in the mood from the rest of the film, and was an unusual departure in genre for both O. Henry and Leonid Gaidai. In the second story, Makes the Whole World Can, a thief breaks into a man's house at night. Unexpectedly, the thief discovers that the owner is suffering from the same medical condition as he, and the newfound friends go out for drinks. The majority of the runtime is devoted to the Ransom of Red Chief, in which a pair of criminals kidnap the child of a rich man hoping to sell him back for a nice ransom. The kid turns out to be an unbearable rascal, torturing the kidnappers with endless pranks and games, while the child's father offers to take the kid back for a price. The latter portion of the film allowed Gaidai to once again indulge in classic slapstick. Gaidai planned to make another slapstick film with a trio from Dog Barbos and Bootleggers, but he knew that a film based solely on those characters would not work. His next film marked the beginning of a fruitful collaboration with two screenwriters, Yakov Kostukovsky and Moris Slobodskoy. Operation Y and Shurik's other adventures introduced Shurik, a nerdy, awkward college student played by Alexander Demyanenko. For Gaidai, Shurik was an alter ego, a projection of himself during his college days. Once again, the film is split into three segments. The first one, Workmate, sees Shurik, who works part-time at a construction yard, ironically teamed up with Fedya, a hooligan he helped arrest, as the latter carries out his community service sentence. The location provides plentiful opportunities for physical comedy, as the two engage in a cat and mouse chase. In the second story, Deja Vu, Shurik is scrambling for lecture abstracts as the college exams are approaching. 
when he finds the abstract he needs in the hands of a young woman named Lida. Both of them become so fixated on their studies that Shurik unknowingly follows Lida into her apartment, leading to a number of comedic moments. The third segment, Operation Y, brings back the comedic trio of coward, fool and pro. Guarding a warehouse, Shurik must fight off the petty criminals when they engage in vandalism on behalf of a corrupt manager. The fast-paced action is accompanied by fitting music by Alexander Zatsepin and cartoon sound effects. Operation Y was a runaway success, becoming the leader of the Soviet box office in 1965 and making Gaidai and his actors household names. Gaidai followed up with kidnapping, Caucasian style, abandoning the anthology setup and making the entire film one continuous story. In the sequel, Shurik travels to the eponymous mountainous region near the Black Sea coast to study the customs of the locals. After reluctantly participating in many drinking toasts, Shurik meets and falls in love with Nina, an outdoors woman. However, a shady bureaucrat is hoping to win Nina's heart by invoking the ancient tradition of stealing the bride, with the help of the familiar Stooges. The naive Shurik is tricked into helping with the kidnapping, before realizing what he has done and setting out to free Nina from her prison. For the female lead, Gaidai picked Natalia Verley, a charming circus performer who had little acting experience, but had no problem with the film's many stunts. Unlike Operation Y, kidnapping has a lesser emphasis on slapstick and, as was the trend at the time, includes two popular musical numbers. Once again, Gaidai's latest film exceeded all expectations. Despite that, Gaidai and his screenwriters knew that they wouldn't be able to use the same formula over and over. The diamond arm was a change of pace, moving away from physical comedy towards the slightly more serious genre of a spy spoof. Yuri Nikulin, no longer a part of the satirical trio, plays Semyon Gorbunkov, a simple bookkeeper who unknowingly becomes involved in international smuggling, carrying jewelry hidden in a cast. Simeon is recruited by the police to lure out the criminals, represented by a likable duo of clumsy cronies. Gena, a well-dressed man with aristocratic habits played by Andrei Mironov, and contrasting him is Lolik, a crude thug portrayed by Anatoly Papanov. Gaidai's wife Nina Grebeshkova, who often had a secondary role in his films, played the role of Simeon's wife. The diamond arm also made an accent on another trend of Gaidai. For films made in the 1960s USSR, his works had an unusual amount of erotica, an undressing scene in Operation Y, a couple of revealing attires in Kidnapping, and an outright striptease in the diamond arm. Somehow, such moments managed to skirt past the censors. Ilya Ilf and Yevgeny Petrov, two inseparable writers, wrote several satirical works during the relatively liberal period of the 1920s, which were later banned by Stalin's strict censure policies. Reprinted during the thaw, well after both authors' deaths, The Twelve Chairs was well suited for a Gaidai picture. Ippolit Vorobyaninov, a timid former aristocrat now working as a government clerk, learns from his dying mother-in-law that she hid a box of diamonds inside of a dinner chair, one from a set of twelve. Not knowing the locations of the chairs, nor a way to obtain them, Ippolit reluctantly teams up with Ostap Bender, a charismatic con man. Working with very limited resources, the unlikely duo resorts to several cons to fund their quest, coming across a potpourri of quirky chair owners. Father Theodore, a priest who overheard the deathbed confession, joins the rat race. Little-known Georgian actor Archil Gomeshvili 
was supported by an ensemble cast of veteran actors, as well as Guy Dai himself. Sticking to the source material, the director limited the number of his trademark slapstick moments in exchange for witty dialogue. Невеста у вас есть? Кому и кабыл невеста? Больше вопросов не имею. Почем опиум для народа? Это что ж, ваш мальчик? Мальчик? Кто скажет, что это девочка, пусть первый бросит в меня камень. Continuing with the literary theme, Гайдай turned to Mikhail Bulgakov, another writer active in the 1920s. Most of Bulgakov's plays were far too scandalous, even by the Thaw standards. Although not the source of Gaidai's next film, Ivan Vasilyevich changes profession. Combining comedy and science fiction, Gaidai adapted the script to a modern setting and brought back the character of Shurik from his previous films. Now a scientist, Shurik builds a time machine which creates a portal directly into the throne room of Ivan the Terrible, causing a commotion in 16th century Russia. The superintendent of Shurik's building, Ivan Puncha, along with Georges, an apartment thief, accidentally wander through the portal and become trapped on the other side, while Ivan the Terrible himself is forced to spend some time in modern Moscow while Shurik repairs the time machine. In the past, Buncha pretends to be the Tsar, doing a rather unconvincing job, while in the present, the Tsar is mistaken for a drunk Buncha by his wife and a neighbor. Yuri Yakovlev delivered two great performances, as the thundering Tsar and the awkward Buncha, and the film became yet another Soviet blockbuster. Returning to the genre of slapstick comedy anthologies, Gaidai adapted three stories by Mikhail Zoshenko in a film titled It Can't Be. The first story, Crime and Punishment, has nothing to do with Dostoevsky's classic, and everything with a corrupt store manager who is detained by the police over a trivial issue. In a matter of hours, his wife, expecting confiscations of illegally obtained goods, sells all of their property, the house, and marries another man. In A Fun Adventure, a cheating couple is trying to get away from their spouses, but end up learning that their spouses, in turn, are cheating on them. And A Wedding Incident involves a man who is getting married, but has very little recollection as to what his intended looks like, leading to ridiculous misunderstandings. As usual for a Gaidai picture, it starred a large cast of established actors, including some long-time associates. After a long period of critical and box office success, with several star hits released one after the other, the second half of the 1970s began a relative decline in Gaidai's career. Incognito from St. Petersburg is an adaptation of a classic comedy of errors by Nikolai Gogol, the Inspector General. In 19th century Russia, a young arrogant man is mistaken for a government inspector in a small town. He takes full advantage, being treated with luxury, given large bribes, and asks for the mayor's daughter's hand before successfully escaping. Despite the experienced actors, the film did little to stand out from other adaptations of the same story and is mostly forgotten today. Gaidai's next film was a joint Soviet-Finnish production. Working together with director Risto Orko, Gaidai adapted Borrowing Matchsticks, a Finnish book, filming the picture in Finland and casting a mix of Soviet and Finnish actors. Antti, a villager, is sent by his wife on a simple errand of borrowing matchsticks from a neighbor. The task becomes an adventure when Antti runs into an old friend. The two of them drink a large bottle of booze and cause quite a ruckus in a nearby town ended up in jail, 
while increasingly incredible rumors about them spread through their home village. Gaidai's only work with the renowned actor Yevgeny Leonov, the film was met with a lukewarm reception in both Finland and the Soviet Union. After spending a decade adapting literary works and making period pictures, Gaidai once again turned to the themes of modern Soviet society. Borrowing heavily from his earlier works, Gaidai combined the race after a treasure from the Twelve Chairs with the seaside setting of kidnapping Caucasian style. In Sport Lotto 82, one of the four travelers in a train compartment places a lottery ticket inside of a bestseller novel. With everyone reading the same novel, the books get mixed up and the characters hike far into the mountains, chasing the ticket to a large cash prize. Mikhail Pugovkin, a regular in Gaidai's films, is particularly notable in this picture as the shady salesman San Sanich. Even though the film is not as innovative as Gaidai's previous works, it's still remembered today as one of his better pictures. Revisiting his first comedy, The Groom from the Other World, Gaidai made another film about a pedantic bureaucrat nearly 30 years later, titled Dangerous for Your Life. On the way to work, Spartak notices a damaged power line wire on the ground. Afraid that someone will get hurt, he decides to stand guard, recruiting a passerby drunkard as an assistant and informing the police of the incident. However, the police department has another serious emergency to deal with and Spartak is in for a long day. Fortunately, a chance encounter with an ice cream saleswoman makes their deal worth it. In the meanwhile, Spartak's workplace is falling apart without him there to take care of the paperwork. With major government reforms fast approaching, Dangerous for Your Life would become one of the last films based on traditional Soviet values. By the late 1980s, Mikhail Gorbachev introduced perestroika, or economic restructuring of the country, and glasnost, a policy of transparency and enhanced freedom of speech. Gaidai's film Private Detective or Operation Cooperation is a crime comedy revolving around the recently legalized cooperative enterprises. Dmitri, an unemployed clerk, becomes a private detective, running the small business with his father. While investigating a kidnapping case, he runs into Lena, a stubborn journalist. Lena changes her appearance to infiltrate various groups, be it prostitutes, alcoholics or biker gangs. Helping Dmitri is Major Cronin, an ethereal and omnipresent Soviet policeman. Trying to capture the liberal zeitgeist of the perestroika, Gaidai openly poked fun at the various criminal activities which always existed in the USSR. The film is clearly influenced by the Western culture of the 1980s, with the appropriate music and fashion, and even allowed itself a brief nude scene. Gaidai's next film was an over-the-top Cold War spy spoof, convolutedly titled Weather is good on Deribasovskaya, it rains again on Brighton Beach, referring to a historic street in Odessa and an immigrant neighborhood in New York, respectively. Just prior to the collapse of the USSR, the Cold War adversaries agreed to work together to eliminate the Russian Mafia in the States. The generals in charge of KGB and CIA, who are now close friends, assigned their best agents to the task. Dmitry Haritian stars again, this time as KGB agent Fyodor, essentially a comedic Soviet take on the 007. A top-secret spy, he parks his plane on the Red Square and announces his arrival in New York through a newspaper. His American counterpart is Mary Starr, a CIA agent as fearless as she is stunning, who must occasionally rescue Fyodor from the many predicaments he finds himself in. Their target is a man only known as The Artist, 
a mafioso who disguises himself as various Soviet leaders. It was quite fitting that Gaidai began work on this film in the Soviet Union, but by the time the film was released, that country no longer existed. Unfortunately, the spy comedy turned out to be Gaidai's last film. Several months after the film's release, on November 19, 1993, Leonid Gaidai succumbed to a pulmonary embolism, age 70. The legacy he left us is great. Dozens of treasured comedies, hundreds of beloved characters, and millions of happy viewers. On the next episode, a resurgence of war films in the wake of the thaw.